Yes, hello everybody. Welcome to the biodiversity seminar of today. Very proud to have uh, Lukas Keller here today. We have been waiting quite long for him. I asked him early in the year and he's now here in November, which is good because in the first semester we were not allowed to do on-site uh, seminars, so it's actually good we have him quite late here. I'm going to introduce Lukas very quickly. It's not a complete introduction and probably a bit biased towards my interest, but uh, I'll try my best. So Lukas is a full professor at the University of Zurich since uh, 2018 in animal evolutionary biology. And broadly speaking, his uh, main research topics are evolution, population genetics, quantitative genetics, and conservation biology. Lucas actually studied zoology at the University of Zurich, but then he did his PhD in Wisconsin Medicine in the US and uh, in wildlife ecology. And he, after his PhD, he stayed for six more years at this university, then went to, for three years to Princeton University and three years to Glasgow University. And finally, after 12 years abroad, Lucas came back in 2003 where he continued as an assistant associate and finally a full professor, as I just said. So Lucas has and is originally, Lucas originally and continuously worked with birds and uh, for example, song, song sparrows, Galapagos mockingbirds, great tits. Uh, and he also did a numerous, numerous studies with Darwin's finches together with the famous uh, grants in, at Princeton University. And already early Lucas was among others interested in inbreeding depression, genetic drift, small populations, and more and more he investigated such phenomena and processes not, not only in birds, but also in mammals, for example, in wildcats or in alp, alpine ibex. So although Lucas generally handles uh, co-authorship very conservative, meaning that he doesn't put himself on each publication of the group, um, this has led to 105 publications and nearly 20 book chapters of uh, high relevance. So today, Luke is one of the world leading scientists in conservation genetics and genomics, I would say. Last but not least, since 2018, Lucas is the director of the Zoological Museum at Uni of University of Zurich, situated between the main buildings of ETH and the uh, university. So originally I contacted Lucas to give a talk about Alpine Ibex genomics uh, in this seminar, but then he actually suggested that Christine Grossen is the much better person to do that. And Felix and I decided to invite both. So uh, Christine was here in September, I think, and she gave a talk and Lucas actually suggested to talk about uh, measurement, the importance of measurement errors in evolutionary and ecological science. So we also accepted this offer, of course, so I'm proud to have him here and I hand over to you, Lucas. You will talk about quantifying inbreeding depression, the triple whammy of measurement error. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christian. And thank you for being here, either physically or virtually. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to speak to you about one of my hobby horses. Now, if you have a gray old guy in front of you like me, then you usually expect him to give a great overview talk, right? Starting way back in history and uh, going all the way to the most uh, relevant uh, recent uh, advances. In my case, as an evolutionary geneticist, I would certainly talk about some of the next generation sequencing techniques and what they can tell us about the world. But that's not what I'm going to do today. Instead, I'm going to do something completely different. Um, I'd like uh, to present to you some of the ongoing research in statistics uh, that I've been involved with and that is centered on measurement theory. Because in the end, much of what we all do has in some way or another to do with something we either measure or estimate. And before I get into that and tell you why I'm interested in this and why I think it could interest you as well, I need to introduce my partner in crime on this. This is Steffi Muff. She is a professor of mathematics in Trondheim in Norway. I was very lucky that a few years ago, I was able to hire her as a postdoc to start this project. And uh, we're continuing it ever since. And so really she's the brain in the project. Yeah, I do the talking and she thinks. Um, that's basically the division of labor. Okay, what's the jumping off point today? All fields that we're involved with, be it ecology, evolutionary biology, environmental sciences, conservation biology, et cetera, are ultimately quantitative sciences. 
What does that mean? It means that we are interested in the magnitude of certain parameters, not just in whether they're significant or not, or whether they're positive or negative. We actually want to know how big is this estimate. And progress in nearly all of these fields in the end depends on a quantitative understanding of the magnitude of the parameters we are interested in. Now, as the title suggests, and because of my history, the example I'm going to use today is the example of inbreeding. But I'd like to make it very clear here that this is just an example that comes from the stems from the fact that this is very close to me. I have a lot of data on it, and I can say a lot about measurement error in inbreeding. But really, what I'm talking about applies to any other field, and I could have taken any example from behavior, ecology, evolution, or the environmental sciences. So, but because of who I am, you're stuck with inbreeding today. And I give you an example of the quantitative nature of this, why we're interested in parameter estimates, not just whether or not inbreeding depression exists. And I will jump off here uh, with a paper from uh, Hanna Koko and Otz uh, 15 years ago in evolution. And basically they reviewed the literature on inbreeding and inbreeding depression. And they uh, reminded us all that inbreeding has benefits and costs. The costs are known as inbreeding depression. So these are the negative impacts that inbreeding has on fitness related traits. But you're also more related to your offspring if you inbreed and therefore it has kin selected benefits. And so whether or not we expect animals and plants to inbreed or not depends on a lot of variables, including the magnitude of the benefits, the costs, and any associated environmental variables that can magnify or reduce these benefits and costs. And the, the theory that they reviewed uh, suggests that together with the parameter estimates we have for the benefits and the costs suggests that actually animals should engage more in inbreeding than what is observed. So as they summarized, there is a mismatch between theory and data. And why do animals not engage more in inbreeding given its kin selection benefits? Or in other words, why don't we have more of these guys? Uh, Ramses II married his two of his sisters, and when they died, he married his daughters. So clearly the uh, Egyptian pharaohs understood um, maybe not the kin-selected benefits of inbreeding, but certainly the wealth-connected benefits of keeping the money in the family. So why is this not from a biological point of view now happening more? Why don't we see more inbreeding than um, in nature? And uh, Coco and Ott suggested four possible explanations, not mutually exclusive. All four of them could be uh, applicable simultaneously. One is that maybe the conditions, the ecological or evolutionary conditions that predict low inbreeding tolerance could be more common than we think. These are situations where sexes invest equally and substantially in offspring. Could also be that models fail to capture reality properly um, or that inbreeding depression, the costs of inbreeding, which have been measured most often are actually underestimated in nature. And finally, uh, an explanation that maybe there is more inbreeding and we just haven't looked for it properly. And all four of them are very interesting uh, explanations. And if I was interested in inbreeding in this talk, I would go into all four of them. But since I'm interested mostly in a statistical aspect, I'm only going to focus on one of those four explanations, the question whether inbreeding depression might be underestimated in nature. And uh, to answer that question or to ask that question more to the point, to ask that question, could it be with, that our estimates are underestimates? I'm going to move to a study system I know very well. These are the song sparrows on a small island on the west coast of Canada, Mandarty Island. And just to make the point that it's small, it's none of the big islands you see on this aerial photograph. It's this little piece of rock here. And on this, uh, it's really a seabird colony. And on this seabird colony, breed anything between about 12 and 150 of the song sparrows that you see to the right in these pictures. And I'm not going to go into any more detail. The, we know an awful lot about these song sparrows, including how inbred they are, and that makes it possible to study the effects of inbreeding on all sorts of traits. And this is uh, what is commonly found, and which is what led um, Coco and Otz to think that uh, why, why isn't there more inbreeding, inbreeding in the animal kingdom? is that we find some inbreeding depression. 
but there is also the associated benefits. And here is uh, an estimate of the inbreeding effects, the inbreeding depression in my male lifetime reproductive success. So on the y-axis is the number of offspring produced, not offspring that survive that are produced by a male as a function of his inbreeding coefficient on the x-axis. And you can see there is a, an awful lot of scatter, but on average, there is a clear decline with increasing inbreeding of the male there he has less and less offspring that are left in the next to the next generation. Classical case here, a 10% increase in inbreeding reduces male lifetime reproductive success by about 25%. It's quite substantial. This isn't just a little bit of inbreeding depression. Where does that come from? It comes from various um, parts of the life cycle that are affected that then lead in some to these effects on lifetime reproductive success. And I'm only gonna look at one because it's important and at the other one because it's fun, particularly if you're an aging human being like myself. So here you go. This is one of the explanations. Male, male song sparrows on Mandarty actually gain a substantial proportion of their reproductive success through extra pair paternity. Yeah. So they have also offspring that are raised in another female's nest. Both males and females um, look after the offspring. So the male looks after his own offspring in his own nest, but he has another male also look after his offspring in other nests. Yeah. And quite a bit of variation comes from that. And there is a very strong effect of inbreeding on the extra pair success that a male has. And you can see that here. So on the Y axis, on the X axis, excuse me, again, male inbreeding coefficient here now categorized rather than continuous. And on the Y axis, the proportion of extra pair young that they sired. And you can see that in some cases, some of these dots, this male had 100% of his offspring extra pair. That's not very common. Most of the, it's more in the 20, 10, 20% range, 30 maybe. But again, what you can see a very strong decline in the success that males have extra pair mating success. And this is actually one of the major drivers of um, this effect of inbreeding on lifetime reproductive success. The other driver comes from <clears throat> senescence that is different in outbred and inbred song sparrows. So here you see the typical male song sparrow and his senescence. You see uh, the age of the bird on the x-axis going from one year of age, so when they become adult for the first time, to the 10 years of age, which is the oldest we've ever observed. This is, again, the total number of independent young they raise, so young that are independent from parental care. And you can see a classic picture of how they become better at it, which is very common in animals. Yeah, the first one year or sometimes several depends on, on the organism. Uh, they're still uh, not such uh, good parents, uh, but then they become better. They stay at a high. And then at some stage here at the age of about seven in these song sparrow males, senescence kicks in and they become less and less effective at reproducing. This is the pattern for an outbred song sparrow. Here's the pattern for an inbred male. <clears throat> you can see that the same increase uh, from the second to the, uh, from the first to the second year, but then senescence already starts in the third year. Yeah, much, much earlier onset of senescence, and it's all done and dusted by the age of seven because no inbred sparrow ever uh, became older than the age of seven. So a combination of inbreeding effects on reproduction and on survival explain the strong effects that we see on lifetime reproductive success. Okay, so these are the sort of the, the setting of the, the example of, for looking at uh, uh, all of this. And so the question now is, could it be that this underestimate, it's quite substantially a 10% increase in inbreeding, 25% reduction in lifetime reproductive success, could that yet be an underestimate? Hmm? Why would this be? Well, inbreeding depression is typically estimated from regressing fitness traits on inbreeding coefficients. That's what we've done in the graph that you saw in, in bigger before. But inbreeding coefficients, so the X variable, the, the independent variable, yeah, they are often measured with error because of these extra pair paternities that I just told you about, or other forms of pedigree errors, or had we used molecular markers, and I'll show this for you later in, in, an, in an example from IBEX, the same is true if you use molecular measures of inbreeding, there is also inaccuracies in that. And as I will now show you, these inaccuracies could lead to an underestimation of inbreeding depression, and they actually do lead to an underestimation of inbreeding depression in these song sparrows. 
But before I show you exactly how this works, I just would like to um, quickly clarify what I mean when I speak about variables that are measured with error or measurement error in short. Really what I mean, it's basically any form of uncertainty, yeah? So it's not just a classical measurement error. I didn't get it quite right with my calipers. It's any kind of uncertainty. Or to paraphrase Max Planck, measurement error is uncertainty in our recording of nature's answer to our question. And this uncertainty can contain a lot of different things. It contains the typical measurement imprecision or error yeah, that we have because our calipers or our balances or all of those things have small errors associated with their measurements, but also incomplete or biased observations. And missing data are measurement error in the way I look at it because they're an extreme case of uncertainty. We have absolutely no idea what the measurement is yeah, if it's missing but also preferential sampling. Um, that is something that happens a lot in, in a, a spatial statistics, yeah, where we, for example, if some bias that we have that is, comes from preferential sampling in all of my studies is I don't study the animals where they're really rare, huh? because that's just not very efficient in terms of gathering data. But that means that my locations that I study the animals in are an, a non-random sample from the complete distribution of a species. And again, this leads to uncertainty in uh, certain estimates. <clears throat> Misclassification errors, if I think that I just heard a great tit, but in fact it was a blue tit, uh, that would be a misclassification error that happens in point counts, for example, but also misalignment error in spatial models if I'm actually not quite where I think I am, or if I use the center point of some grid to sample something, then these are misalignment errors because I don't sample exactly where the organisms are. So this list is not complete, we could go on, but so if I estimate a parameter and I use this estimate, then this estimate has an uncertainty associated with it, that also would be part of measurement error. And I'll show you an example of that in my own work later on. Okay, so why does this uncertainty matter? Why does it matter that the inbreeding coefficient, the X variable, the, deep, the independent variable is measured with error? Simply because in linear regressions, and in fact, in all uh, linear models, they don't need to just be a regressions and they don't need to be linear, but linear in the predictor, we assume that the X variable, the explanatory variable is measured without error. Yeah, you can read that in the textbook of statistics that are now a hundred years old, but we keep forgetting it when we actually do it. This X here, we assume is measured without error. The epsilon, the residuals, yeah, you all know this equation, classic linear equation, linear regression equation, the epsilon has error, but the X has no error in it at all. Now what happens when you introduce error? So here is an example of a linear regression with an intercept of one uh, and a slope of one centered so that um, the intercept one is at the X variable of zero and a variance, an error variance of 0 0.1. Very simple little simulation. And now we are at error. So now we say we can't actually observe X. What we observe is W and W is a sum of both X, the explanatory variable, the true value, which we don't know, and some error u. And u, again, we assume is normally distributed with a mean of zero and some variance here in the example one. So this means we have an error-prone measure. w is no longer a, um, w has an error, it's, it's x plus an error, but the error is unbiased. So on average, if we take the average w, it equals a the average X. Yeah? So on average, no bias, nothing, just random error in all of this. And now if we add this U, this error to X, and we regress Y not on X, the true value, but on W, then this happens. Yeah? Nothing other than random error added to X so that we now regress it on W and we get a whole bunch of things because you can see three things. First of all, you see the red line, the red regression line. We have a biased parameter estimate. Yeah? The slope is less than what it actually is in this particular example. Furthermore, that's maybe a bit harder to see, uh, but uh, we'll see it in some later graphs. Clearly, the spread of the red values is actually larger than the spread. So the, the epsilons are larger 
in the red case than in the black case. So we also have a loss of statistical power. And finally, even graphical model analysis is difficult. Yeah? So if you do any kind of residual analysis and you look whether your residuals are distributed in a particular case, this too becomes more difficult. And this, these three effects, bias, loss of power, and difficult graphical analyses are what um, Raymond Carroll in his uh, well-known book on measurement errors in nonlinear models calls the triple whammy of measurement error. So bias parameter estimates, loss of power, and difficulties with graphical analyses, and hence the title of my talk. So what are the effects of this uncertainty now uh, on uh, parameter estimates? We've seen it. We can have an underestimate. That's what we saw, a reduced uh, regression uh, slope in that example. But I'll show you another example too later on. The reverse can also be the case. We can have overestimation due to measurement error, something that's known as reverse attenuation. Both is possible. To predict in which case we are, whether we have an underestimate, an overestimate, and by how much, we actually need to know a lot about the error in our data. Yeah, we need specific knowledge of the error, its distribution, its relationship with dependent variables, independent variables, and, and also not just its own, not just the variable where the measurement error occurs, but also other variables that are correlated with it. And finally, we need to know the model structure. It makes a big difference whether our models are linear or nonlinear. So you remember this uh, graph, this attenuation, this reduction in the slope, in the regression slope due to measurement error. Could this actually explain the lo low estimates of inbreeding depression in nature that then led Coco and Otz to wonder why there is not more inbreeding out in nature? And to answer, or at least partially answer that question, we return to Mandarty Island, this small island in the Pacific, and ask ourselves whether inbreeding depression might be underestimated there. And why could it be underestimated? Well, again, because of the extra pair paternities. 28% of offspring among song sparrows are extra pair young. So inbreeding coefficients just based on the observed pedigree are error prone. Yeah, if I just observe who mates with whom and who raises children together, then I get the wrong pedigree. But I can use molecular markers to check who actually the father is or to determine the actual father. And then I get genetically corrected uh, pedigrees. Now, I'm never going to say that a genetic pedigree is error free, but it, at least it is less error prone than the ones based on observations only. And so the Mandarty data set gives us a chance to actually compare what estimates do we get if we use the error prone social pedigree, as we call it, or the less uh, error prone genetic pedigree. And this is work I did already uh, m several years ago with Jane Reed. You see her here now. She uh, has since been a professor at Aberdeen and now also part-time in Trondheim. And what you can see here is the effect of errors. So on the left is the result of the pedigree with more errors to social pedigree and to the right without errors just for simplicity or at least less error. And on the y-axis, you see an estimate of that slope, which in the inbreeding literature is called inbreeding load or lethal equivalence for those of you who know it. But basically, this is just a regression slope. Yeah? And because inbreeding on average is costly, is, is detrimental, the regression slope in the all likelihood, in almost all cases, is negative. Yeah? And what you see is a classic case of attenuation with errors. Oops, I think I just went forward. Huh? Um, with errors, our regression slope is not very large, and it actually uh, encompasses zero. This is for females now, not males. Males is a, somewhat is the same uh, story, but different values. Yeah. But if I actually correct for the errors, then we get a much, much higher, more than three times as large effect of inbreeding on lifetime reproductive success. And also, while it wasn't statistically significant here, as you can see, it's clearly significant now. So we say both of or two of those three triple whammies here, we see the reduction in power that comes with errors and the attenuation, so the flattening of the regression line towards zero. So clearly, in our case on Mandarty, when we actually used the social pedigrees, the pedigrees just based on observation, we clearly underestimated the magnitude of inbreeding depression in the wild. 
But that's not all necessarily so. So the slide I just showed you with lifetime reproductive success, here comes adult male survival. And you can see here that it doesn't make such a big difference whether we correct for errors or not. But the estimate with errors is larger than the estimate without errors. And because this is a logistic regression model, you have positive slope actually means it's, it's a positive effect on mortality. So it's actually inbreeding depression. But you can see that when we correct for the error, we find hardly any inbreeding depression. But if we um, don't correct for errors, then we have a little bit, at least, inbreeding depression. Not statistically significant, as you can see, but worrying, we actually get an overestimate in the presence of error, not just an underestimate of the true effect. I'm not going to go into details why this is so. If someone is interested, I can explain, but it's a bit of a longer story, which is why I'm leaving this out. Even more worrying, uh, Steffi, Jane, and I then reanalyzed some uh, of the work we've done on inbreeding effects on the immune response in the song sparrows. And we actually subsampled an analysis that we had done earlier um, actually to show the effect. So it's a slightly rigged example, but only very slightly rigged. Um, and what we found in these analyses where we looked at the immune response of song sparrows to tetanus vaccinations, to measure as a measure of uh, the strength of their immune system, you can see that we found a really uh, we found a very strong effect of inbreeding. That's X in this case, negative effects so or strong inbreeding depression. Uh, also, a, a, a substantial difference, although not significant, between the sexes, and in a strong interaction such that one sex uh, males showed hardly any inbreeding depression in immune response, and females showed a strong inbreeding response. Now, when we corrected that data set, so this is the social estimates based on the social pedigree, when we used the genetic estimate, then this interaction disappeared. It became much, much less and was no longer statistically significant. So what happened? Why did this interaction disappear as soon as we correct for errors in the explanatory variable, the inbreeding coefficient? And um, to see what's happening, uh, this is a slide from Steffi. So it's a bit, uh, uh, it's got a couple equations on it that to try and explain this. You see again, uh, it's a bit more uh, rigorous notation than what I use. So you see first again, the equation for a linear regression with an interaction. So we have to intercept the effect of inbreeding, the effect of sex, and then the, the interaction between sex and inbreeding. And again, we assume that we can't measure the inbreeding coefficient correctly, the x, so we measure some substitute, which is affected by error, uh, particularly in the case of um, the social pedigree. And now we make an assumption, which is that the error is not the same in the two sexes. If we assume that the error in uh, the one sex, let's say in females, is different from the error in males, then we can actually see that uh, we get such artifacts and interactions appear out of nowhere. So we assume for here, this is in a simulation now, we assume that there is no, in, in reality, there is no interaction. Yeah, the sex by inbreeding interaction is zero. But as I just showed you, we assume that the hair, error variance is different in males and females. Uh, that's something that's called heteroscedasticity in statistics. And when you do that, you get artificial, it, a significant spurious interactions that don't actually exist in your data. So I'll walk you through these plots. This is the plot of the um, uh, regression analysis here on the x-axis is the inbreeding coefficient. And these curves here just give you the distribution, uh, the frequency distribution of the inbreeding coefficient. So we used for simplicity just a normally distributed variable, as you can see. And here are the two regression lines, one for male, one for females. And you see that the trait value, because there is a difference in the sexes in the average immune response, the trait values are different, but the slopes are the same. They react to inbreeding in the same way. So there's no interaction, just as we put it into the simulation. Now we simulate the W, an error-prone X, again, with um, as before, but with different variances for males and females. And then this happens, yeah? You see this, 
the slopes are no longer the same, suddenly we have a spuriously popping up interaction. And this can maybe better be seen in these graphs. These graphs show you the frequency distributions or the, the posterior distributions of the estimates for the intercept here, for the effect of inbreeding here, for the differences among the sexes here, and for the interaction here. And the black case is the error-free case. So you see uh, there is an intercept, there is an effect of inbreeding, there is no effect on average of the, between the sexes uh, in immune response, and there is no interaction. Now red is what happens if we add error to the inbreeding estimate. And you can see here what I said earlier, uh, that you can see the loss of power. Here yeah, you can see how this distribution is wide or we are less certain, even for the intercept. Yeah? The intercept has no error, but still, the error actually propagates from the slope estimates into the intercept. We get a very strong bias here. You see that um, in with the effects of inbreeding, and here it's attenuation, so it goes uh, to, to a value less. So zero is over here. Uh, the sex effect again stays the same, has no bias, but less certainty. And here, a highly significant interaction that doesn't really exist. No. So measurement error, if you stick them, if, it, if they're not exactly the same in different groups uh, that you model in your models, you will pick up spurious interactions that don't really exist. Even worse, this is not just the case when the error variance is heteroscedastic. So if the error variance is not the same in males and females, because this may not be so common. Yeah? In this case, actually, it's not entirely obvious why the inbreeding estimate should be more precise in males than in females. It isn't. Huh? It is the same. But when the sampling variance is in groups 0 and 1 are different, um, then, so then the interaction term is, can also be biased. Yeah? And that is very common in the kind of biology I do, because for one thing, usually you have one sex is more common than the other, or one species is more common than the other, and bam, you have differences in sampling variance. So, to summarize this bit, uncertainty in X, be it inbreeding or any other explanatory variable, can have large effects uh, on our estimates and lead to serious loss of power, bias, parameter estimates, and spuriously significant results, even, and that's important, yeah, in a very simple linear regression model. Nothing's fancy, no GLMM, no nothing, just good old linear models. And so far, we've considered error in inbreeding coefficients uh, from extra pair paternity, a particular type of error. But I just want to show you that other sources of error do the same thing. For example, when you measure inbreeding from molecular markers. And uh, for that, I'll take you to the IBEX project that you heard a lot about from Christine Grossen. And, but we're not going to look at any genomics today. We're simply going to look at inbreeding uh, effects and measurement error in that. And uh, lots of people were involved in this project. Uh, Claudio Bozzuto and Tony Ives did the population dynamic modeling. Iris Bibach collected all the samples in the field and uh, did all the lab genetics. And Steffi Muff, you already know her, did the measurement error theory. So just to put us back into the context of these, of these Ibex, you know that they went almost extinct uh, uh, over 100, 200 years ago. Um, only less than 100 animals uh, remained in Italy in the private uh, hunting reserve of the king. Uh, some of them were stolen, brought to Switzerland, and led to a reintroduction effort uh, starting more than 100 years ago. Um, and the important thing for us is that this led to repeated bottlenecks with uh, varying levels of inbreeding in the different populations. Um, the reason is this introduction history. Everything started in uh, Gran Paradiso. Then they came to two zoos uh, in Switzerland. And from there, three first populations were established that also grew very well. And then from these three populations, all the other um, populations in Switzerland were founded. So there is substantial variation in inbreeding in these populations because of the differences in history, but there is also substantial variation in population dynamics. And this is the time series of 26 Swiss uh, populations of Ibex. The x-axis is year since reintroduction, so zero is when a population was founded. And you see that the longest time series when we did this analysis was 96 years. So quite an impressive data set that the Swiss hunting authorities have put together based on annual counts of these animals all over Switzerland. 
And the main point here is just a tremendous variation in, in population dynamics. Yeah, some grow very fast and then uh, uh, plateau. Others grow fast, plateau early, crash again, come again, and others uh, don't ever grow very well uh, at all. Uh, this is a log scale uh, on the y-axis, by the way. No? And so clearly ecological variables have a huge impact on population growth in, in ungulates or any, any species for that matter. So we're by no means thinking that inbreeding is the major driver of this variation, but we still wanted to know whether some of that variation in population growth is affected by inbreeding. So Claudio and Tony did uh, some state-based modeling uh, that I'm not going to go into in detail, just to say that we modeled both variation in the true population size and then variation in the counts, which, which are a, a sample of what's actually out there, and uh, fitted nonlinear models with uh, Kalman filters. Um, but the main point for today is just that these models work pretty well. The black line is the fitted uh, dynamics of the Alpstein uh, population and the red dots are the counts. So we get a pretty good fit of uh, the model to the data. And then we wanted to know, okay, we can, from these models, we can calculate population growth. Uh, what effect does inbreeding have on that? We sampled uh, 700 animals from 26 populations, genotyped them at a whole bunch of microsatellite loci, and then quantified population-specific inbreeding. So not the inbreeding of an individual, the average inbreeding of a population using a measure called population-specific FST that summarizes or, or, or measures the amount of inbreeding due to drift relative to the last common ancestral population of all these Swiss IBEX populations. And when you stick this all together, you find that inbreeding actually has a quite a strong effect on population growth rates. So the graph, just first of all, to explain to you, population growth is on the y-axis. It's again a log transform, so uh, it's not uh, R0 directly. Here is the inbreeding coefficient. You see that some uh, alpine ibex populations are quite highly inbred, and you see that the size of the bubble is just how uncertain or certain we are about uh, each estimate from each population. And you see that on average, there is a very strong decline in population growth rate with increasing inbreeding. But we were only able to find this statistically significant once we corrected for the uncertainty in these estimates of inbreeding. So the top slope, minus 5.85, and you see the confidence interval includes zero, is without correcting for uncertainty in F. And it's only when we corrected for uncertainty in F, or Steffi corrected for uncertainty in F, that we found a nearly, not quite twice, but substantially higher, not quite twice, but sort of like 80% higher slope higher effect of inbreeding on population growth rate. And then it was also statistically significant. All of this varies with rain, but I'll, I'll um, skip this because this is about measurement there and not about what happens on, to Ibex out there in the Alps. So how did we do that? We did a bunch of measurement error modeling. There are several appro approaches that have been proposed in the literatures methods of moments, simulation extrapolation, some quasi-likelihood approaches, and also Bayesian approaches. And I'm just going to quickly show you how this works with the Bayesian approaches, which we used in the IBEX. Basically, that is actually true for anything, not just the Bayesian approaches. We need, a, in order to account for measurement errors in these models, we need to know the measurement error model. So we need to know what kind of error do we have? What's the distribution of the error? In other words, what's the measurement error variance? And it's really important uh, to note that if we don't know what the measurement error variance is, then it makes no sense to model measurement error. Yeah? And in fact, you can show this if you, if you think you know the measurement error variance and you're wrong, you, do, you make things worse. Yeah? So assuming an error when you don't know it is a dangerous thing to do. Um, and although we've, I focus here on measurement error modeling, the response error modeling may also be crucial. Uh, so the error in Y, that's what we're far more used to think about, but it can also interact with the measurement error and then it gets very tricky. So, but then essentially what you do is you have your regression model, which is your familiar form. Yeah, you have your, exp you have uh, your beta zero plus beta X plus something else, um, other covariates. And, and this is just to indicate that this is sort of the general notation. It's, it's an, uh, it could also be a nonlinear model, but the, the um, 
predictor here is linear in the end. But then what's really important is that we need this error model. So we need to know what our, how our error arises and how big it is, how big its variance is. And then finally, we need an exposure model. That's a model that says, what's the distribution of the X variable uh, accounting for all potential dependencies of X on other covariates? And then because it's uh, Bayesian, we need priors and hyperpriors. And when we do that, we can use Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling or integrated nested Laplace approximations to solve these models. Steffi has shown in a paper how this is done. And it's a very technical paper. Um, and, and what she's shown is that INLA is a very good uh, way of doing it because it's also very fast. So you can actually do simulations, which is sometimes difficult with MCMC samplers because it takes so long to solve them. So I kept this short. This is very technical. This is something better done when one reads paper than in a talk. To finish, I just wanted uh, to show you very briefly that everything I've said does not just apply to inbreeding. Uh, I still stay in quantitative genetics because this is where I'm at home. And the results I want to present you now are a study that uh, Timothée Bonnet did together with Erika Ponzi. Erika uh, is also a mathematician. She did her PhD with um, Steffi. Here she is in a field course. Uh, and Timo Tibone is an evolutionary biologist who is currently in Australia as a postdoc who did his PhD also in Zurich. And he worked on snowballs in the Swiss Alps and on uh, evolution and phenotypic selection in snowballs. And I'm not going to go into any great details except to say that we estimated uh, heritability in a, in a physiological trait in, in these snowballs. And we did this in a naive way, which means we do not correct for error in the measurements. And we did it in an error aware way where we fixed these errors as good, well as we could. And the main point to show to you is that uh, heritability is substantially underestimated, yeah, nearly by a factor two, not quite. But also the selection differential that's then calculated is severely underestimated if you don't correct for errors. So predictions of evolutionary change under climate change, unless you correct for measurement errors in your variables, will definitely be wrong. But I should actually qualify what I just said, not definitely be wrong. We, uh, we being Erica, uh, did then actually an entire set of uh, quantitative genetic estimates on these data. And this is a bit a hard uh, table to read. Basically important for us today is here are various parameters you might want to estimate. Top of all additive genetic variants, the heritability here, the selection gradient that I just showed you, but then also the response to selection, something we're very interested in the context of uh, predicting effects of climate change. Yeah, And those of you who know these studies, you know that it can be done in two ways, either using the breeder's equation, yeah, the famous breeder's equation that comes from agriculture, or STS, which is price equation uh, that takes a different statistical approach to um, predicting response to selection. And here you can see whether or not we found any effects of measurement error. And you see some are unbiased. So the additive genetic variance is actually unbiased, but the residual variance is biased, heritability is biased, selection gradient is biased, as I just showed you this. And then what is really, really interesting is the difference here between STS, the price equation, and, and the response to selection. The price equation is unbiased by the breeder's equation is biased. So not all parameters suffer from uh, the problems of uh, inbreeding, uh, of uh, measurement errors, but many do. And it's really interesting that it really depends on this. It's not, it's actually very scary because it depends on the exact details of the statistical model, whether or not you expect significant effects of inbreeding depression. Perfect. That leads me to summarizing up. Um, so, I, I hope I've been able to show you that uncertainties and measurement error in covariances are the rule in, well, no, I haven't shown you this. So I'll claim, let me start the sentence again. I would claim that uncertainties and measurement error in covariates are the rule in much of ecology and environmental sciences, behavior, and so on. But its effects on statistical inference have mostly been ignored. I certainly ignored it for most of my life, and I think much of the literature in ecology, evolution, behavior completely ignores it. 
I think, I hope I have made it clear that ne this needs to change if we want to be able to make quantitative predictions. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll be unlucky with our quantitative predictions or we'll be wrong if we don't correct for measurement errors. Such methods exist from other fields, mostly from epidemiology, actually, but they all require good data on the nature of the error. Yeah. And that exists rarely. So we can't even use these methods in most cases because we do not have a quantification of the nature and the magnitudes of error in independent variables. So this is really what needs to change, I believe, in our field. We need to start to spend more effort, both in time and finances, to actually determining the accuracy of our measurements. But we also need to work more on, not we, but the people who can do it, <laughs> need to work more on error modeling techniques because much of what I've shown you in here, the theory assumes normally distributed errors. It's a convenient assumption, probably correct if you measure body size or something like that. But with other traits, it is not necessarily so. And if we have time later, I can tell you why this is not the case, for example, in measurement errors of inbreeding. Uh, and there can be some really complicated error models and uh, we need more th mathematical theory to, to be able to handle more realistic error structures in biology. I think uh, the tide is rising in the sense that uh, people have started to realize this. This is a paper that came out last year from uh, Christian Damgaard, where he pointed out uh, the, the problems of measurement errors more in environmental analyses and, and species distribution models and those sorts of things. So I think it's coming, but we still have quite a way to go. With that, I thank you for your attention and I thank all the people who've contributed to the work that I've been showing you because hardly any of this is done by myself. And here is Debbie who contributed also to the IBEX data a lot. And finally, a lot of thanks to this guy. He shares 50% uh, of genes with me, at least that's the expectation. And he's an astrophysicist and it was his question, so it's my brother in other words, um, for those of you who don't know uh, the relatedness coefficients off by heart. He's an astrophysicist and it was his questions to me 30 years ago, almost to the day, when he said to me, so do you guys never worry about measurement there? And I said, well, that's, well, I don't know. And uh, so that led ultimately to the project I'm doing. And um, uh, so thanks to Christoph for uh, kicking this, this thinking off in the first place. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>